Dear child of God, you may know this or not. You may have heard this before or never. I don't know where you are, what you are going through, or what you are thinking right now. But here's what I want you to know today. You are God's chosen. You are special to God. Peter, in a letter by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote these words. 1 Peter 2 verse 9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. It is not every day that you may wake up feeling like a chosen one of the Lord. Maybe today's one of those days. Maybe you're not even having your best day today. But on such a day, here is a voice you need to hear. God has chosen you. You are a very special person to God. No matter who you are, where you're from, where you've been, what you've gone through, where you are right now, you are very important to God. Why am I special to God? Why did he choose me? What did he see in me to love me this way? I need to know why, really. Maybe these are the questions you're asking yourself right now, and because you can't find the answers, you are forced to believe otherwise. However, the truth is this. There is no one who can tell you the answer to those questions. Remember King David? He was called a man after God's heart. David was fond of pondering upon God's love and mercy. He was fond of writing and singing about God's goodness, mercy and love that never fails. In one of his many moments, David must have pondered on these same questions for a while, but found no answers because he wrote thereafter. Psalms chapter 8, verses 3 through 6. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. David, a man who enjoyed the love of God over him, was in awe over God's special attention on his beloved creation, humanity. Science is yet to explain the earth in entirety. They are yet to explain the vastness of space. To consider all of the beauty and mystery in creation, you might find yourself wondering like David, why man? What did he put in humanity? What's so special about our creation that he pays so much attention to us? And not only the attention, the Bible says that God only made man a little lower than himself, his angels. What a privilege. And listen to this also. If this love is poured on and available for all men, sinners included, how much more those who have accepted and come into God's family? Maybe you don't believe me or you feel you don't qualify for this because of where you've been or the manner of lifestyle you find yourself stuck in. But there is something unique about being chosen by God that you have to know. When God decided to choose you, it was not because of who you were or what you were doing. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Think about this, that while humanity, you and I, were in our worst, God gave his son Jesus as a lamb to rescue us from sin and eternal destruction. The sacrifice of Christ was not only for people of the past, but for everyone who would be born into this sinful world of ours. Your best friend is not guaranteed to die for you. You may never know until there's a chance to prove it. Your brother or sister may not. Maybe there's someone that may give up their freedom or their lives for you. Maybe to protect you from a false accusation someone may step up. But imagine you were guilty. Imagine you deserve the punishment. Imagine that you deserve justice to be served because you are a serial sinner, a liar, a murderer, a complete opposite of all things good. Who would step up for you? I don't think anyone would. Romans chapter 5 verse 7. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. Yet, in our worst, the Bible said that's when Christ was crucified, not for himself, but for you and I, for every sin that exists or will ever exist on earth, for every soul that will ever be born, 
for every boy or girl, man or woman, every soul, and that includes you. So when you ask yourself why God chose you or what makes you special, it is not about you but Him. It was His decision to look down on earth and point to you as His choice. This perfect God, this eternal being, this almighty God who is able to wipe away and recreate all life in existence with the snap of His finger. The same God looks at you and places His choice on you. You don't have to feel it. I know we live in very cruel times. There's very little love out there. Even the house of God where you expect to find yourself surrounded by love, you find yourself surrounded by judgment, hatred, and loneliness, and you are forced to believe that there's nothing good about you. Maybe also, you look around and you see your contemporaries getting it right. The best jobs, contracts, understanding partners and relationships, living in good houses. When they try stuff, they get it once. But when you try, it's failure upon failure. Maybe you've never been applauded or recognized for anything special before. I want you to know something today, my friend, that no one sees how valuable you are. That does not mean you are not valuable before God. Do you know why you exist on earth at this time? Do you think you're an accident? Even if your parents never planned for you, or you were born outside wedlock, or you had complicated experiences surrounding your birth, you are not a mistake. Revelations chapter 4 verse 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Everything on earth exists to serve a specific purpose of God that will bring Him satisfaction, including you. God placed you here because of a special purpose of His. You are that special to Him. He didn't put you here to fill up the numbers. You are not an animal, but a man. A man that God loves and wants to embrace within His warm embrace. God was going to do something great in earth, and He thought of you. That's how you were chosen and put here to be born by your parents. Remember how Jesus was born? If you feel that because your birth was complicated or your parents' relationship was complicated, look back to Jesus. In a land that was governed strictly by the Mosaic law, a young woman who was betrothed to a man was found pregnant. How do you explain that? Not only so, she claimed he was the Son of God and would become the Savior of humanity. As expected, no one would believe her. Matthew chapter 13, verses 55 through 57. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? When then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. No one from his hometown believed in Jesus. He was the son of the local carpenter after all. He also grew up to become the carpenter as well. Maybe he even worked their tables and chairs sometimes. No one would accept there was anything special about this man who was born in a manger. Yet, that Jesus was born in a manger or grew up in a poor neighborhood was not the yardstick to measure his uniqueness before God. And we have Jesus for our example. My friend, God has chosen you because like Jesus, you are special to Him. You may not feel it, but once you embrace this true identity, it will do something in your life. Yes. Just embracing this truth will affect a lot of things about you. For example, if you embrace the truth that from today, you're going to walk like someone who is special to God, chosen by Him for a special purpose, you will begin to be careful about the kinds of places you go to, the kind of people you hang out with, and the kind of things you want to be listening to. If God chose you, it's because there's something great and good within you. Through a relationship with Him, He will unveil that unique treasure to you. If there's a treasure within you, that means like every other treasure, it can be overshadowed, covered, or even corrupted by other things if exposed to them. Hence, your walk in beauty and relevance in this life begins with you accepting that you are God's choice through faith in Jesus. You see, when Jesus died, he made a way for you to come to God, for you to have a relationship with Him, and for the light of God to help you see all the good that's hidden in you. The world is filled with darkness. This darkness is what makes you and I live like something we are not, like people we are not, addicted, 
downtrodden, depressed, and with destructive tendencies. However, once the light of Jesus invades your heart, you begin to realize your true self. I don't belong here. There's more to me than this. I can't remember this way. Yes, I've come this far, but it's not the end for me. There's more. This comes from knowing you have been chosen. It doesn't stop with knowing you've been chosen. What would you do with this knowledge? Would you leave it lying dormant, or would you rise up with it, engage it, and make sure you live it up? This is the secret to your joy and fulfillment. You've been struggling to start your journey to fulfillment. You have been struggling for acceptance, so you've accepted whatever lie the devil told you about yourself. No matter what lie you've lived before now, there's a truth I want you to remember. God loves you and has chosen you for a special purpose. You're special the way you were born. Turn back to God and let his light shine into you to show you the treasures buried deep within that cover of your destiny. Today, God is beckoning you. Will you heed his call? It's not too late to start living like that special person that you are. Not because everyone is clapping for you or because you have a thousand dollars in your account, but because God has chosen you. You will be amazed to know how beautiful life can be if you will start living like one whom God has chosen for a special purpose and who is called God's special child. You're all right, my dear friend. You are special before your heavenly Father. Answer that call and become that person today. Every relationship depends on quality time and attention to flourish. If we want to experience true intimacy with God, we must learn to quiet the clatter and enter into His stillness. The day a couple becomes too busy for themselves, their marriage and family begin an almost certain descent into the failure of that relationship. Quality time, space, and attention are the glue for every lasting and successful relationship, and so it is also with God in His dealings with us. Child of God, I want you to understand that God loves us all and speaks to everybody He has created. But there are times when the relationship between you and God becomes more than the usual relationship that a Christian has with Him, and God requires your own personal relationship with Him. In fact, your personal relationship is more important to God than anyone else. He said He would leave 99 sheep in search of the hundredth that got lost all through the dealings of God with a man over the years in history in the Bible, anytime God wants to distinguish a man from the rest of his generation, he calls him aside into a quiet place. God wants you alone sometimes because of the weight of the instructions he wants to pass to you. In the army, there are operational details that are available to every member of the team, but there are some other classified operational instructions and details that are given specifically to certain operatives because, within the scope of that operation, their own target supersedes what everyone can know. In the same vein, there are instructions that are specific to us, and whenever God wants to pass that information that transforms our lives and generations, He requires that solitude with you. In the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 6, Jesus instructs us on how to pray, and He says, But when you pray, Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. God wants you alone sometimes because He wants your attention. He wants your communion with Him. Your prayer is a communion with God, a time in which He relates to you. In that secret, quiet place alone with God, the Spirit of God has the opportunity to search through your calm heart and the answers to prayers that you haven't even prayed are released. When God wants to commune with you, He wants it to be alone, just like a human relationship with His own partner. When God wanted to deliver the children of Israel from Egypt, He turned to Moses, who was alone in the wilderness tending to his father-in-law's sheep. An angel first appeared to Moses in the form of the famous burning bush that would not be consumed. That picked up Moses' interests, surely, but God didn't speak to Moses until Moses turned away from his world, the sheep, and went towards the bush. Exodus 3, verses 3 through 4 says, So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. 
When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. God didn't speak until he was sure Moses was alone with him, not just in body, but in attention. The instructions of God are passed to specific people in answer to peculiar generations. Remember the story of Moses and the children of Israel? In the wilderness, God was always speaking through words and his actions to the Israelites. The same Israelites saw some of the heaviest demonstrations of the power of God. The pillar of cloud by the day, pillars of fire by the night to guide their feet, the effortless parting of the Red Sea, and manna from heaven as food were among the various ways God showed himself to his people, the children of Israel. But in the book of Exodus, chapter 24, verse 2, when it comes to instructions that will change the course of the whole generation, the Bible says of God's instructions to the people of Israel, only Moses is allowed to come near to the Lord. The others must not come near, and none of the other people are allowed to climb up the mountain with him. When God wants to pass information to you that will change the course of not just your life and destiny, but also that of your generation and your world at large, he will want you to be alone when those instructions come, because they come with tailored instructions that are only conceivable in your heart. Then Moses went up onto the mountain alone, and while he was there, the Bible says two tablets of stone were given to him after he had conversed with the Lord. Those stones contained the Ten Commandments upon which every lawful way of dealing with God and others in his kingdom depends. The solo journey that Moses made to spend time with God away from others produced one of the greatest bodies of instructions from God. Until today, those commandments have remained the fulcrum on which our Christian dealings rotate. The reason why God wants you alone sometimes is because he wants to give you instructions and commandments that will guide your life and that of your generation. Anytime God is looking for an avenue to deliver instructions to his people, he will isolate the man whom he has chosen to bear these instructions to the world. Remember what I said to you earlier about the weight of the instructions? For every child of God, there are instructions that are free for all. Everybody has access to them. But instructions that carry the weight of a people require a man to carry them. And that man is a man who must have mastered the place of solitude because that is where God's choicest instructions are passed. In the stillness. Do not misinterpret it. To a child of God, loneliness and solitude are two different things. According to Dr. Richard J. Foster, loneliness is an inner emptiness. Solitude is inner fulfillment. A man who must attain a certain spiritual stature and understanding of the deepest things of God must master the place of solitude with God. One of such men was Jacob in the Bible. In the book of Genesis, chapter 32, verse 24, the Bible says, So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. The world is a very distracting place to exist, with all the activities and constant movement. There are always inner fights between your need to remain relevant and comfortable in the world and your need to create time with God. The aftermath of the wrestling match between Jacob and the stranger, who was in fact an angel, was a passage of a generational blessing to Jacob that represents one of God's greatest people to this day. His name was changed to Israel. Child of God, listen to me. When God wants to change your story and place you in a position of reverence and generational reference, he will meet you at your place of solitude, where his spirit can battle with some of your hindrances in your life that might affect his perfect will for you. Jacob didn't leave that place without a scar. He battled with an angel, and the angel had to shift a bone in his hip socket to stop the fight. He meets you when you are alone, child of God so that he can wrestle some things out of your life that is impeding your effective carriage of the weight of transformation he is about to bring your generation through you. God wants you to be alone sometimes because that is where and how he can prepare you. The journey ahead is always a tougher one because we don't know what is ahead. No one has been into the future before except God, who is the future. Now consider this, 
The God who is the future comes down to you in the present to prepare you for the future he created. You have a first-hand peek into the future when God prepares you, and he can only do this when he meets you alone, separated and focused. David was destined to be a king in Israel. God had chosen him as the next king to replace the erring King Saul, but the chosen David had to be prepared over many years in the wilderness for the kind of leadership God was going to bring through him. David said in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34, But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock. I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. The Bible and history record that every battle King David faced, he won. He liberated every city God instructed him to win in his days, and Israel never lost a battle under his leadership. The reign of King David is regarded as one of the greatest in the history of humankind because of the kind of preparation he received when he was in the wilderness, receiving training from God and the wise men over his life. God wants you to be alone sometimes because he wants to use that period to train you for the assignment he wants to place in your hands. It might get lonely sometimes. It might feel like you are missing out on so many things. And rightly so too, because you are actually missing out on so much when you are with God. But the assignment for your life and destiny is worth every sacrifice you will make to be prepared for it. Elijah the prophet was on the run. The queen of the land had an order out for his head to be delivered to her. After he had beheaded hundreds of the prophets of Baal after they failed a contest, Elijah took to his hills and this happened. A prophet who called down fire on more than one occasion and was feared throughout the land was on the run. The Bible says he ran into the caves for fear of being killed by the men the queen Jezebel had sent out to hunt him. The Bible says in the book of 1 Kings, Chapter 19, verse 7, that the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. In the caves, alone from the world, by himself, the Lord's angel appeared to prepare him for the journey ahead. Child of God, the journey ahead is long and many tire easily. But when you have stayed long enough in the secret place, fed by God and his angels, your journey becomes swift, tireless, and easier because of capacity. God wants you to be alone sometimes so that you can build your capacity for the assignment of a lifetime. Have you ever experienced a difficult phase of having to wait in your life, where all you want is answers, yet feel absolutely clueless? Waiting months, even years, to see how God will act in a situation may be quite tough. Because I'm the sort of person who loves to get things done fast, waiting has always been difficult for me. I'm happiest when I'm working on anything and it works out as planned. However, I am a firm believer that God helps us grow by guiding us through the most challenging circumstances. I also believe that God hears our prayers and will respond at the proper time. It's time for you to wait on God until He answers. Your appointed time of favor has come. He is going to answer your prayers. I'm sharing this with you because I believe you're going through something similar. Perhaps you've been waiting months or years for a response to an unanswered prayer. It might be causing you grief or despair that you carry with you on a regular basis. Perhaps you've been treated unfairly and have been hoping for God to intervene on your behalf. Perhaps a member of your family has been unwell for some time, and your prayer for God's healing has gone unanswered, and you're afraid you'll lose them. Perhaps you lost your job and have been praying for months because you're still unemployed. I'd want to remind you that God has placed you in this period for a reason. God has his reasons to make you wait. Have you listened to some? God wants you to wait for strength. Isaiah 40, 31 says, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. 
They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. God wants you to wait for His will to be accomplished, Hebrews 10, 36 says. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. Waiting renews our faith and strengthens our faith in Him, Psalm 33, 20-22 says. We wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. You can communicate to God and tell Him your concerns and wants while you wait. He desires for you to convey your troubles and burdens to Him. It's important to talk to God and tell Him how you're feeling. Of course, He already knows, but He desires a relationship with you and desires for you to come to Him with your needs. While you wait, study God's Word in the Bible. The scriptures give us the truth, but Satan and our own self feed us lies that will discourage us while we wait. Finally, as Jesus advises in Matthew 34, we must wait without anxiety. Anxiety means that you pray, but yet you start doubting whether that prayer request is going to be granted. Quit doubting God and give Him time to work on your request. He will grant it because, unlike men, God never fails. Always take inspiration from God's servants who waited and eventually reaped the benefits of God's favors. Jacob waited 14 years and put in a lot of effort for Rachel to accept him as his wife. After God commanded him to construct a massive ark and people mocked him for it, Noah waited for the rain to fall. Sarah waited until she was in her 80s to have her first child. Job was devastated when his entire family died and he lost everything he owned. Despite this, he never lost faith in God and waited for God to respond to his pleas and prayers. We learn from these servants and many more others that when God has heard your prayers and has promised to answer, nothing and no one will stand in his way. It doesn't matter how difficult the situation looks, he will answer. God is going to uplift you from the abyss that you find yourself in at the moment. Life's situation looks difficult only in the eyes of men, not God. You serve an omnipotent God. He has never changed. He has never stopped loving you. He has loved you even when you least deserved it. He has blessed you continually even when you've taken Him for granted. He has forgiven even when you've sinned knowingly. He provided His own Son to die for your sins. I get emotional when I think about how much God has loved us. Words will never be enough to quantify. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Isaiah 40, 31 Having to wait on God after your prayers have gone unanswered is one of the most difficult situations to be in. There are moments when we pray with all our might, knowing that we really need God to intercede, yet nothing happens. There's no change. Nevertheless, the need may become much greater. It's easy to pray and wait with tremendous anticipation for God to respond, large and boldly at first. However, when the days, weeks, months, and years pass, we may begin to question if God is really listening. We might become tired of praying when weeks and months pass without a clear answer. We start praying less earnestly and seldom. This has always been human nature. And I'm here to remind you to be a greater Christian than the typical. Continue to pray and wait for an answer. Your appointed time of favor is coming. We wait for God to deliver, answer our prayers, refresh our power, to accomplish what only God can do. Because He is God and we are not, we wait for Him. We are changed and strengthened as we wait on the Lord. We are always waiting. You wait to fall asleep at night. You wait for emails to be answered, Amazon packages to arrive, your paycheck to arrive in our bank account, individuals we're sharing Christ with to react to the gospel, and so on. We wait for the Lord to deliver, save, avenge, answer our prayers, provide for our necessities, refresh our strength, display His glory, and do what only God can accomplish. 
Waiting is only feasible within the confines of time. God, the creator of time, is unaffected by the passage of time. He has already acted while we are waiting for him to act. God is patient with us, and he knows how to wait. His notion of time is very different from ours, yet his timing is flawless. This is illustrated by this verse, 2 Peter 3, 8-9. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Despite the reality of God's word and the numerous professions of God's immense grandeur and strength that pour forth to acclaim him from the skies above and the mountains below, mankind has chosen to dethrone God and enthrone King Self, disconnecting their lifeline to their sole way of escape. If he delays, there is a reason, and any delay oozes a supplementary flow of kindness into a Christ-rejecting, wicked world, allowing sinners to turn to Christ for salvation allowing the prodigal son to return to the father's grasp, allowing the saint to grow in grace and knowledge of his lovely Lord Jesus. Isn't this wonderful? Take a moment to think about it. He is a God of second chances. Every day that passes is another demonstration of God's long-suffering kindness towards humanity's children. May you avoid getting carried up in a mindset that blames God for inaction and instead focuses on His incredible grace for every one of us. May you come to the unshakable realization that our times are in His hands and that you shall one day walk into His eternal presence at His allotted moment and in His appointed method when faith will fade into sight and hope will be emptied in joy. God does not take long to fulfill His promises to us, and any perceived lag in man's perception cannot invalidate God's flawless, unfolding plan. He will respond when He's ready, which will be soon. It's time for you to wait on God until He answers. The story of Lazarus, a companion of Jesus, is recorded in John 11. When Lazarus became gravely ill, his sisters Mary and Martha informed Jesus. Instead of rushing to assist, Jesus purposefully delayed his arrival. Lazarus then died. Lazarus had been dead for four days by the time Jesus arrived. This was done on purpose. Lazarus was supposed to be raised from the dead according to Jesus' plan. Before Lazarus showed any signs, Jesus knew that he would get ill. Before each of us was born, God documented every day that he planned for us. Jesus had a plan before Mary and Martha sent for him and that plan included making them wait. This same God who calls the galaxies by their names is unfazed by our predicament. He is aware of the situation. He's always known, and it's part of his plan for us to wait. Waiting on God is beneficial to us. We would be in charge, not God if he acted promptly every time we shouted out to him. We'd make the decisions, and we don't have his knowledge. We learn to trust him and his timing as a result of having to wait. How well do you rely on God? Don't sit in the waiting room for too long. While you wait, ask God to empower you and generate persistence, character, and hope in you. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and courageous in your waiting. Those who wait will be rewarded, and His timing is impeccable. He's aware of the situation. He's always known, and it's a part of His plan for us to wait. Your heart's wishes sometimes take time to manifest. They don't appear out of nowhere. When God appears to be the most silent, he is usually at work. Despite the fact that Daniel had to wait three weeks for his request to be answered, God had truly answered it in the same day he prayed. Don't assume that because God doesn't disclose his response right away, he hasn't answered it or that he hasn't answered it yet. It's time for you to wait on God until he answers. Just like Daniel, your appointed time of favor has come. As Christians, we are always involved in a fight that is waged in many ways throughout the day. Our objective, according to Ephesians 3.19, is to be completely filled with God Himself. Meanwhile, 
Satan's purpose is to instill his evil in us, since he can't operate without someone through whom he can work. God clearly tempts us to love and treat others well, whereas Satan tempts us to do things that separate us from God and do harm to others. The issue is, which temptation will we succumb to? We must pay great attention to the temptations we confront in our everyday lives, since we become slaves to whatever we succumb to frequently, whether good or negative. We might easily succumb to the temptation to feel pity for ourselves during difficult circumstances. However, if we want to praise God, we must learn to be steady in both good and difficult circumstances. God is our fortitude, our courage, and our invincible army, according to Habakkuk 3.19, who helps us achieve spiritual development during our high places of struggle, pain, and responsibility. In fact, in Christ, we are more than conquerors. We have the ability to overcome any temptation that the enemy throws our way and emerge triumphant on the other side. Don't wish for problems to go away. Pray that when they arrive, you will not be taken in by Satan's lies, since God is capable of assisting you and is on your side. God won't let you fail in the face of the enemy. You are being tested. Do not give up on your faith. It is something that we all have to do to get through the difficult moments and seasons. There are many variables, unknowns, and circumstances that we all must face and deal with, whether it be personal, business, mental, or emotional. Pushing through the difficult circumstances and emerging on the other side is one of the most difficult things to undertake. It might be difficult to see the light at the end of the tunnel, especially when you're stuck in the middle of it. However, the only way to get there is to persevere and push through. Life's challenging moments and conditions prove to be difficult tests. On the other hand, reward, advancement, and growth are all found on the other side. The other side is typically the light at the end of the tunnel, depending on what you're looking for. This is the point at which all of your hard work pays off and the results start to appear. That is the point God bestows your reward on you. That is the point God grants you the rest you so well deserve. Once you arrive there, you are greeted with a sense of success, achievement, and pleasure that you were able to sacrifice and arrive at the destination you sought. One thing we do know is that getting there will need effort, commitment, patience, and labor. The pleasant fragrance or sensation associated with passing a test is frequently part of the payoff at the end of the road. Continue being strong in your tests. God has something better in store for you. James 1, 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Today I have something to say to you. Sometimes the tests you're having are the product of your own poor decisions. They are sometimes the result of ungodly harassment and unfair treatment from a Christ-rejecting, God-hating, Christian-despising, sinful world. You can try to fight through it in your own strength, wondering if God really cares as the pressure mounts until you finally give up. Or you can remember that God is in charge and rejoice in the Lord and consider it pure joy, seeing it as one of the many trials God will use to fine-tune your faith, increase your dependence on Him, develop your Christian character, and bring you closer to spiritual maturity. He'll do this because He loves and cares for you. He will do this because He has your best interests at heart. He will do this because you are His child. He is a caring Father. The advice we collect from James 1 is not unique from the heavenly wise counsel we earn from the other apostles, for James also encourages us to approach our various trials with a joyful celebratory mindset, recognizing that the testing of our faith tends to produce perseverance, and that if we meet perseverance with a heavenly attitude 
of complete trust in God and confidence in His unfailing Word, we will find that the end result of that testing trial will be the perfecting of our faith as we grow in grace. Let us grow in our understanding that God uses our difficulties for our everlasting good and His greater glory. The greater the test, the more God's ample love extends its arms to hold you up and take you through and bring you into a level of intimacy with Himself that you would otherwise miss. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus. The book of Hebrews has a remarkable list of people who have been praised by God for their faith. It's a list of recognized and unidentified men and women who lived lives that honored the Lord. Men like Abraham, who sought out a city whose builder and maker was God. And women like Sarah, who believed God would keep his promise. They are referred to as a great cloud of witnesses, and they demonstrate a faith in God that is a wonderful testimony to God's faithfulness in their lives, as well as a great inspiration for us to run the race that lies ahead of us and press on for God's high call as we look to Jesus, the writer and implementer of our faith, who survived the cross for our own sake. Life is a race with a finish line, and we are urged to fix our heart's gaze and our soul's determination on the objective of our calling. And that goal is our Lord and Savior, Jesus. How critical it is that you let go of whatever is impeding your growth and seek the Lord Jesus unwaveringly and unflaggingly. Knowing that you are following in the footsteps of such a great cloud of witnesses, let us strive to put aside every load that impedes our individual Christian life so that we do not fall into the sin of lack of faith, which can so effortlessly beset us in life. And let us run the race that is set before us with perseverance, setting our eyes on Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer. Jesus wants you to shift your eyes trustingly, earnestly, and intentionally toward Him away from everything that hinders or halts your spiritual progress. He wants you to stare at Him with a spiritual eye of faith because it pleases the Father that we look on His loving Son who loved us immensely. He wants that you seek His shed blood for salvation and that you partake of His broken body. He wants for you to see His earthly existence as the most beautiful example of a live sacrifice offered to the Holy Spirit. Today, in your trials, look to the man who lived a spirit-filled life, doing solely what the Father told him to do, a life that was directed by God. Look to Jesus when you face temptation. Look to Jesus when things are not working out. He will walk you through your troubles. Just like his servant, Job, God wants to remain faithful in your trials. James 1.12 Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Our adversary is out to derail our trust in God's kindness, and his tactic is to sow seeds of doubt in the minds of all believers so that their lives are neither fruitful nor honorable to the Lord who bought them. The hardships and sufferings that the adversary uses to shake your faith may be used as a catalyst to increase your confidence in God. If you continue in His strength, you will bring honor to your Father in heaven, and an everlasting recompense will be waiting for you that patiently endures. In your own power, you may not be able to stand steady in this wicked day, but God has promised that His grace will be sufficient. In your trials, His grace will strengthen you. In your trials, His unconditional love will make you strong. Jesus reminds us in Matthew 24, 13, But the one who endures to the end will be saved. 
Jesus wants you to persevere in your faith to the end. It makes no difference what you've been through. It makes no difference where you're from. It makes no difference who you are. He wants you to realize that it is through difficulties and tribulations in your Christian life that you refine your confidence in God and grow in your dependency on Him. The personal difficulties and dangers you face in your daily life, as well as your reaction to others' distress and despair, are frequently determining factors in whether you hold fast to your belief in Christ's sufficient strength or allow seeds of doubt to darken your heart to God's goodness, causing you to be tossed to and fro in a sea of uncertainty. For a moment, life may seem to be running smoothly. Your work is enjoyable. It's fun to hang out with your friends and family. Your objectives, finances, health, and perspective all appear to be positive. Then, out of nowhere, life tosses you a curveball. You are fired from your job. A family member or a friend betrays you, and so forth. In these conditions, how do you trust that God is good? Trusting God is more than a sentiment. It's a decision to trust what He says, even when your feelings or trials lead you to believe otherwise. It's important to consider your situation. God is concerned about both of them. However, they are insufficiently trustworthy to serve as a foundation for your existence. They are subject to change at any time. God, on the other hand, is the same. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and so is deserving of your faith even in your trials. Jeremiah 29.11 gives us that amazing assurance of God's good thoughts concerning our lives that gives us hope no matter what it is that life may throw at us. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. He is God, the monarch of the universe, telling you, Hey there, I am on your side, and I've got this. Trust me. These are points to note in the understanding of God's plan for everything. Here is what this understanding proves. First, it proves that God is almighty and can do as he wills with us, in us, and for us. Secondly, it proves that he not only can, he is willing to do it. Thirdly, his intentions are good and pure. I know there are usually some fears when it comes to trusting God's plan for you sometimes. Maybe you are like, what if trusting God is a mistake? What if he's not there the way I want him to be? What if my faith messes everything up for me? These are the fears that make you say you trust God, yet you have alternative options for the just-in-case moments. Just in case God doesn't show up in time. Just in case God doesn't give me what I want just in case God fails entirely. However, this is not how faith works. This is not the faith that works. To trust God is to trust God like you trust the air you breathe, the sun to shine, the plane to fly, and so on. Trusting God's plan is believing that He is able to do what He has promised to do for you in the best way and in the best time. About the integrity of God's plan, here is how the Bible puts it in Isaiah 14, verse 24. The Lord Almighty has sworn, surely as I have planned, so it will be, and as I have purposed, so it will happen. Know what each phrase is saying here. The plan is rock solid. The plan is real. The plan is powerful, just like the speaker is. Remember, I told you before that the integrity of a word is in the integrity of the speaker. If a rich man gives you his word, you'd believe it more than the word of a poor person because the rich guy has the resources to back up what he said. Likewise, the integrity of God's word and plans is the same as the integrity of God himself. Hear what God said to confirm this. Psalms 138 verse 2. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness, for you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. The King James Version puts it this way, 
I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. When he prepares it, he stands by it. God doesn't care more what you think about him than he wants you to think about his word. This is because he wants you to trust his integrity. And when it comes to integrity, a person's word matters more than what they call themselves. God's plan also works the same way. The thing about God's plan is that it is purpose specific than people specific. This means that the thing God wants to do is more about why he wants to do it than the element through which he intends to do it. This also means that the failure of a person doesn't mean the failure of God's plan. Let me give you an example from the Bible. Follow me as I show you this important truth today that will change your mindset about God's purpose forever. Take a good look at the life of Adam and Eve. What was God's plan for them from the beginning? How do you tell what God has in mind for them at creation? Can we find this in the Bible? Yes, we can. Let me show you. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. If you do look carefully, you'd see it all written there. Man was made out of God. He was God's family. He mattered to God. God had direct contact with him and wanted his mark felt on earth today. Therefore, God gave man the complete rule and rulership of his creation. The plan was to have a creation with whom he could fellowship and call family, an earth that could be a place of activity and home for them and a rendezvous point for him and his creation, where he could do his will and bask in the worship of his prized possession, man. However, this plan faced a challenge when the devil made Adam and Eve to sin against God by eating the forbidden fruit. They were removed from the holy garden of God in Eden, and in their lives that plan was in a sense destroyed. But you see, my friend, that plan didn't die. It wasn't destroyed. Nothing can destroy God's plan. No devil in history can destroy it. No mistake of man can destroy it. It may be delayed, pushed forward and all, but it will come to pass. That's why I said before, it is purpose specific than people specific, meaning, if the initial vessel through a plan was to fail, they are replaced by someone else who would be able to carry it out. Today, in the lives of every child of God, that plan of God united with his prized possession is existing and living on in a spiritual sense. And when that Christian leaves this world in death, that plan would be consummated for eternity. See how Romans chapter 5, 17 through 19 says it. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification in life for all people. For just as though the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Also, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. 
what Adam and Eve failed to establish, Jesus filled up and established it for all humanity to enter through faith in his atonement. Though they destroyed what God planned for all people in their own lives, the plan still came to pass. Therefore, if you are asking, can I destroy God's plan? The answer would be no. But if you are asking, can I destroy God's plan for my life? The answer would be yes. What does it mean to destroy God's plan? It means to render it invalid and non-existent. It means to shut it down and erase it from being. This is not possible because the plans and purposes of God can be altered only by God himself and by no one else. But can you alter or render that plan invalid in your own life? Yes, you can. How? By displacing yourself like Adam and Eve through certain activities that contradict the very standards of God for you that suits his plans for your life. What are the ways you can destroy God's plan for your life? First, through disobedience. Disobedience sets you up as independent before God. It tells God you aren't subject to him. It tells God that he can't tell you what to do. And the thing about the plan of God, it flows through his preeminence. Whether there is a Pharaoh there or not, there must be a Moses who God has influenced over to be the major player in the master plan. Disobedience rejects the counsel of God for you. And if you walk in your own way, you cannot get the outcome of those who walk in God's. You know the outcome for Adam and Eve when they disobeyed. Secondly, unbelief in God or lack of faith has the potential to destroy the plan of God for a person's life. A perfect example would be the children of Israel in the wilderness. What do you think the plan of God for them was when they were brought out of Egypt? Of course, to take them into the promised land safely. He even led them through a longer route because he didn't want them to encounter wars that could discourage them on their journey. You see what the Bible says about them in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. Who are they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Just like disobedience, unbelief tells God that he cannot do what he says he would do. It denies his deity. It denies his power. It denies everything God stands for. And it sadly, it displaces us from the plan. Why? Because in order for that plan to come to pass in your life, you have to believe in the initiator, God himself. These two things have a direct influence over any other reason that may hinder God's plan from coming to pass in your life, whether they are wrong associations, giving up, sin, and so on. Therefore, what should you do to bring God's plan to bear in your life? Believe and walk in obedience. It takes believing to walk side by side with God. It takes believing and obedience to work with Him. And if you will be willing and obedient to His words, living for Him, David says in the Psalms, you shall eat the good of the land. Job also says that you shall spend your days in prosperity and your years in pleasure. You will find true rest in this life and in the next only when you are in the center of the will of God. Remember, all you have to do is believe and obey. What do you think your purpose is on this planet? Don't you want to make the most money possible? Are you here to start a family and raise it? Are you here to make a name for yourself? There's nothing wrong with it. But do we believe that's God's ultimate expectation for us each day? If not, what does God need of us on a daily basis? We know what He wants us to do and what He doesn't. Do not deceive. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. Don't be envious of others' possessions. Do not disgrace your father and mother. Don't slander God's name. Only God should be worshipped. Keep the Sabbath sacred don't worship idols, and so forth. Today, let us take a look at what God expects of us each day as believers. With the growth of technology, most of us have developed the habit of checking our phones as soon as we wake up. 
If you try and quit this tendency and instead spend your time with God, your connection with Him will improve. Thank God for another day by reading your Bible and listening to worship music for a few minutes. We have moments during the day when we forget to worship God. We forget that He's constantly present and guarding us. We don't always praise Him as much as He deserves. God desires a deep connection with you, and He desires that you seek Him out regularly in prayer and supplication. This is the will of God, and He wants you to do this every day, every minute, every second of your existence. Listen to what David, the great psalmist, has to say about thanking God each morning in the book of Psalm 143, 8. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Psalm 5.3 In the morning, O Lord, hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my needs in front of you, and I wait. Our shepherd is the Lord, and he's our refuge from the storm. He's the one who loves with a never-dying love, and is a companion who clings closer than a brother, since the Lord's loving kindness never ceases and our Heavenly Father's compassion and mercy provide an endless supply. You must believe in our Father and never question His loving kindness, which is new every morning, just as David did. And you must cry out to our Heavenly Father, asking Him to show you the path you should walk, for God is the one who cleanses your soul. God's plan and goals for us are written forth in His Word, and the Bible should be the unmovable basis upon which we place our faith in Him. It takes practice and discipline to spend time with God every morning. Many things will try to lure us away and distract us, but we must ignore them and create time for our Lord. The enemy frequently attempts to meddle in our lives by convincing us that we don't have time for prayer and meditation and that we will make time later in the day to spend with God. When you start each day with God, He directs you in the right direction because He knows what awaits you. Trusting Him entails spending time with Him to plan your day according to His will. He will lead you down every route you take. He truly adores you. He wants the best for you. Giving thanks to God is the second thing God wants you to do every day. He wants you to be grateful every day that you're alive and well. Seeing you whine all the time does not make him happy. He wants you to be grateful for even the tiniest things in life. Why should we be thankful? We should do nothing else and nothing less just because we're God's creation. God's benevolence brings us joy. Giving gratitude and worship are two ways we accomplish this. The term meaning thanks in New Testament gives us the phrases grace and Eucharist. We express gratitude as we commemorate Jesus' spilled blood and beaten body by celebrating the Lord's Supper. Giving gratitude should be at the center of your life in worship. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. 1 Chronicle 16, 34. If God's love is eternal, you may be assured that God will never abandon you. He will always be patiently waiting for you no matter how long it's been since you last talked to him. God is always gracious to you. God still has affection for you, even if you aren't quite good to him. Not that God will always be gentle and easy on you. He will speak up and bring justice when required. But he will always be kind because he wants the best for you, his child. He's also kind and modest at heart. According to the Bible, God will prioritize you because you come first. God is selfless, sending his only son to die for you. And he has huge plans for you that will not fail. Your sins are not held against you by God. When you make a mistake and beg for forgiveness, God never keeps it against you. God enjoys telling you the truth. God will never deceive you and will always tell you the truth. God will always keep you safe from the devil and even from yourself when you make wrong moves. God protects his child from danger and the adversary by erecting a hedge of safety around you, signaling to the enemy that you are his. This does not imply you'll never be harmed. 
but God is constantly close by, shielding you from dangers you are unaware of. God will never let you down. You can always rely on God because He always delivers. And the least you can do in response to all of God's benevolence is to be thankful every day. I bring you to the third thing God wants you to practice each day. Love others. It's difficult to love others while we're unhappy with them. Make a conscious effort to love people and reflect God's light on them in every scenario. Be the good, godly influence that others, particularly those who do not know the Lord, require. God is the source of love. When you have heat, you have fire. When you have light, you have the sun. There is no love without God. You cannot separate the two. God's nature encompasses love. Love is proof that a person was created by God. It makes sense. If God lives inside you and love comes from God, you should love. Since you were created in the image of God, you should reflect that love. 1 John 4, 7-12 Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world, that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is made complete in us. If God sent His Son to stand in your place and suffer your punishment, then you should love those who appear to be your enemies. However, when we consider how Jesus stood in our place, even though we didn't deserve it, the word enemy no longer seems appropriate. If God allowed Jesus to fulfill all God's anger so that you would not come under God's wrath, then you should not hold others in your wrath, but rather guide them to the truth. What happens finally when you love properly? You shall be able to see God. His love will be perfected in you, which means it will achieve its full maturity. No one will be able to physically see God. However, people will recognize God by our love. Instead of praying for your enemies to perish, pray and love them every day, regardless of what they've done to you. Love for the world came from the Father's heart to a world of lost sinners. And love pours new life into the dead spirit of everyone who believes in His name. And the Apostle of Love implores us to love one another because God is love, and love is of God. As we are fed and renewed with His love in our hearts, Love flows from God's heart to us, and love is to flow through us to others. God's essence is love, and the fruit of His Spirit, which is anchored in love, has sprung forth from Him. Finally, God desires Christians to study the Bible every day. He wants you to always be curious about Him, and the only place you can discover answers is in the Bible. God has provided us with a plethora of Bible information to assist us. I'm presenting information that's been revealed to me via my personal life experiences. I must acknowledge that I do not have all the answers, but I can direct you to a resource that will assist you in discovering your God-given calling, the Bible. To live a life of passion and purpose, I believe we must continue to learn about Jesus Christ and what He believes our mission in life is. We were made in His image, thus many of His character characteristics are ones we should strive to emulate on a daily basis. Mark 13, 31 Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. We embrace eternal life through embracing His Word, clinging to it, delving into it, reading, believing it, and allowing it to change us. This is a crucial concept to comprehend and live by. Consider today the simple reality that everything in life passes away, save our Lord's teachings. Ask God to help you pay closer attention to Him and cling to His every word. All that He's spoken and shown us will last forever. 
and these truths are the only things in life worth striving for. Focus your attention on God's Word and attempt to comprehend its deeper significance so that you can start accumulating riches in heaven right now.